to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ to Jesus' disciples, he said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Friend, the essence of Christianity is the love that we have for God and for each other. That's what makes Christians unique in this life, and that's what Jesus expresses in John 13, verse 34 and 35. Welcome today to our study of the Gospel of John. Beginning today in John chapter 13, following in the next few weeks through the end of the book of John, we're going to notice just the last few days and the last few teachings that John identifies in the life of Jesus. And so we encourage you today, please locate your Bible and be following along as we study the Gospel of John together. Friend, today's messages are being brought to you by Christians, members of the Churches of Christ in your area. We'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. One of the ways that we offer free Bible study as well is through our website. You can visit us, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of Bible study materials, including free CDs and DVDs, all our lessons online, free to download. We have articles and Bible study material that is on our website that would greatly help you in your study of the Word of God. If you've got a question or you'd like to study further, you can also email us write to us or call us and we'd be glad to help you with that. And friend, we also want to encourage you, visit the Lord's Church in your area. Visit the Church of Christ in your local community. You'll find people there who love God, who love other people, who are concerned about souls. And we just want to encourage you to stop by and visit one of their assemblies and maybe like to have a Bible study with them as well. Today, as we transition into thinking about John chapter 13, friend, one of the great lessons that as Jesus knows His time is winding down, as He is preparing now for the final days in His life, Jesus is going to leave His disciples and He's going to leave us with some very powerful teachings that they needed to be reminded of. One of those is found in John 13, 1. And this is the, the love that Jesus had for His disciples all the way to the end. Notice John 13, 1. The Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come, that He should depart from this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world. Listen to this. He loved them to the end. Jesus never stopped loving his children. He never stopped loving His disciples. Everything He did right up to the very last breath when He said, It is finished, was motivated by Christ's love for His disciples and for the world. You see, that love to the end is exhibited in several areas. How did Jesus love them to the end? Well, Jesus taught them the truth which would set them free. John 8 verse 32, you remember Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And friend, right up to the end, Jesus taught them God's truth. Jesus said in John 6, verse 20, 68, or Peter did, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Jesus prepared them for the road ahead. First Peter 4, 16 says, If any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. Jesus prepared His disciples that there would be suffering, there would be trials, there would be difficulties, but it's all worth it in the end. And He got them ready for that. He corrected error that might have been taught. Mark chapter 12, Jesus said to the religious elite, You do therefore greatly err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. And so, in His preparation, Jesus' preparation, Jesus taught them uh, the love of God right up to the end, and of course, His sacrifice was the greatest example of that. Now, in preparing Jesus' disciples, we also see that there is another force at work, and that is the devil. It's sad, but in John 13, 
even though Jesus loved every one of his disciples right up to the end, the devil has already found his way into one of their lives. And that man by name is Judas. Look in John 13, verse 2. The Bible says these words, And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. You know, one of the things we definitely learn about this, the devil, this force that is working in Judas, is that he'd already put his plan into action as well. The devil is a very active, militant, aggressive foe who is trying to defeat God and today is trying to defeat Christians to cause them to sin and be lost. I don't think sometimes we realize that the, the devil is still actively working to try to get people to be lost today. Think about Job chapter 1. There is, as it were, a heavenly council. The sons of God appear before God, and the devil appears also. And God says to Satan, where have you been? From going to and fro, back and forth on the earth. Well, what's that mean? Well, God's next question tells us, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. Blameless, upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. The devil said, yeah, take away everything he's got, and we'll see about Job. The devil was behind that. His going to and fro and back and forth on the earth was that he was actively seeking men and women to tempt and destroy. And friend, that's the clear New Testament image that we're given as well. Remember 1 Peter 5 verse 8? Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? For your, for your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That same agent of evil, the devil, who was actively seeking men and women in Job 1, the Bible says he's doing that today as well. Simon, Peter fell victim to that, did he not? Luke chapter 22, verse 31, and Luke chapter 22, verse 3, Jesus said to Simon, 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 Satan desires to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you. And we know the devil did work in Peter's life. Peter actually went on to deny the Lord. Now, he was restored. He, he got back to where he needed to be. But the devil is a very active, militant, aggressive enemy. And I need to be on guard against the wiles of the devil. 1 Timothy 3, verse number 7. In John 13, we also see Jesus teaching his disciples a great lesson about humility. Here's a, a very tender and compassionate picture of the Savior. Jesus gathers His disciples, as it were, and has them all sit down, if you can imagine that in your mind, and, and then Jesus girds Himself with a towel, and He gets down on His hands and knees, and He washes every one of the disciples' feet. Now, He comes to Peter, and Peter says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you've got no part with me. And in the nature of Peter, He said, well, don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body in essence. But why did Jesus do this? To show humility. Uh, Luke 14, 11, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. He who humbles himself will be exalted. In the kingdom of Christ, it's not about what can others do to serve me, me getting up on a pedestal and everybody else being my servant. No. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He'll exalt you in due time. James 4, verse 6, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 6. And so his great, Jesus' great example of humility was to show his disciples and really to teach us as well that in Christ's kingdom we're to be humble servants of other people. Listen to it this way. In Mark 10, verse 45, Jesus said, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. In Christ's kingdom, I am a servant. I am not on a pedestal. We're not sitting in, as it were, Moses' seat or the chief seats today, looking down on other people. We're servants in God's kingdom. And the master servant clearly taught us that by washing the disciples' feet. Now, one of the reasons he also did that was to show his disciples the kind of love they ought to have for each other. Let me illustrate it in the words of Jesus. Look in John 13, verse 34 and 35. The Scripture records this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, 
as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this. All will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is trying to help his disciples see there's not going to be preeminence and, and prominence in first place in the kingdom of Christ. He's already said, if you want to be first, be last. Last be first, first will be last. But he's trying to help them see the type of love that they ought to have for each other. A new commandment I give you. What do you mean new? That you should love one another. Well, Lord, show me that. As I have loved you, so you also must love one another. When Jesus got down and washed the disciples' feet, that exhibited the type of sacrificial service love they should have for one another. And friend, that's what ought to make Christians unique, that we really do love, that we want to serve, and that we want to help one another, and that we're thinking about others' interest before our own. Hebrews 13.1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 following, Jesus is asked, Good teacher, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is the first and great commandment. And the second like unto it is, love your neighbor as yourself. Friend, do we really love each other in the church? Do Christians really have that type of love for each other? Am I willing to serve others, get down on my hands and knees and get dirty and serve others, to help, to break a sweat, to do what I can to help somebody who might be in need. That's the real type of love that Jesus illustrated in John chapter 13. Now, turning our attention to John 14, knowing Jesus having just told His disciples that He's going to have to die, knowing His hour is near, preparing for them for that ultimate final event, Jesus knew that their heart would be troubled. And so Jesus said in John 14, 1 following, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Were it not so, I would have told you. Friend, as Jesus knew that His disciples were going to be discouraged, they were going to lose heart, knowing that their Master and their Savior is about to leave them, Jesus gives them some things to help them with this discouragement. And friend, as I live life and as you live life, from time to time, we each have heart trouble. There are things that we each have to deal with that may be discouraging or depressing and that we need to be reminded, you know, there's things that will help me get over this. What are those things? Friend, Jesus said, when you've got heart trouble, remember heaven is what it's all about, and heaven is real. Let not your heart be troubled. You've got faith in me. You've got faith in God. There's many mansions in my Father's house, and you can go there. Friend, the, the hope of heaven encourages each one of us not to let this old world get us down. Hebrews 4 verse 9 says, There remains therefore a rest. For the people of God, this is not all that there is. The struggles, the, the fighting the good fight, the, the troubles that we face now, heaven's going to be worth it all if we remain faithful. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Revelation 2, verse number 10. Secondly, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. I'm not leaving you for good. I'm coming back again. John 14, 3, Jesus said, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will. Come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Hebrews 9 verse 28 teaches us that Christ will come again a second time apart from sin for salvation. The Bible teaches us there will be a day coming when we'll hear that shout, the voice of an archangel, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And listen to this, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Where's the encouragement? We can go to heaven. Christ is coming back. The separation is not going to be forever. He is coming back. And friend, let not your heart be troubled. You know the way. Jesus is the way. Jesus said, the way I go, you know, and where I go, you know, and the way you go. And Simon said, no, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to Simon, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. I know the way to get to heaven. I know the way to be a part of God's people who are reclaimed when Christ comes back. What is that way? Jesus. 
He's the way, the truth, and life. If I follow Christ, if I obey Christ, the only name that salvation is in, Acts 4 verse 12, if I am faithful unto death, Revelation 2 verse 10, if I walk in the light, 1 John 1 verse 7, if I am on that narrow path that leads to heaven, when Christ comes back, if I'm in the way, if I'm in Jesus, then friend, I need not be discouraged. I can have the hope of eternal life with God. But Jesus also tells His disciples, don't be troubled because there's other help that you can have as well. And friend, one of the ways that we can overcome heart trouble and discouragement, Jesus teaches us, is through the avenue of prayer. Look at John 14, verses 14 and 15. Jesus says in John 14, verse 14, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. What do we know about overcoming the troubles of this life? There's help to be had. And one of the ways we get that help is through prayer. This is why Paul would say, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. This is why Jesus said in Luke 18, 1, uh, you know, let not your heart be troubled. Uh, we're to pray. Men ought to pray always and never give in to discouragement or let our heart be troubled. And so prayer helps us with that. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, it overcomes much. And as the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 4.16, Christians can come boldly, listen to this, can come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And oh, I love the words of 1 Peter 5.7. Cast all your care upon Him. Why? God cares for you. Is there help to be had? Is there something that can help me to overcome heart trouble when I face discouragement and depression and when life gets us down, what do we do? Let not your heart be troubled. Christians have a special avenue of communication and help through the avenue of prayer. Jesus also said, let not your heart be troubled as it were. If you keep God's commands, that's proof that you love Him. John 14 verse 15, do you remember this statement? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Friend, in keeping the commandments of God and following what the Bible teaches, uh, we have the assurance that we are right with God and it is proof of our love. Remember, the Bible says in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Who obey him. If I'm obeying God, if I'm following His commands, then I have the hope of eternal life. It's not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, that's going to heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, Matthew 7, verse 21. Jesus looked out at the religious elite of his day in Luke 6, 46, and he said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Friend, there's joy in following the words of Christ. There's joy to be found in obeying what Jesus taught and living a life that it's in accord with His teaching because we can know as we strive to do what's right, as we follow the example of Christ, as we try to walk in the light, the promises Jesus made about heaven and eternal life can be ours if we trust Jesus unto the end. And then, of course, in John 14, verse 26, Jesus teaches us that we can find comfort and encouragement in the all-inspired Word that the Holy Spirit's going to leave. Look in John 14, verse 26. Jesus makes this promise to His disciples in this chapter. Jesus says in verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in My name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Jesus is in essence telling His disciples in the immediate context, you're not going to be without help and you're not going to be without word and encouragement from God. Well, what is that word? It's the word the Holy Spirit was going to give them. And friend, that word that the Holy Spirit gave the first century disciples and writers, we have in the pages of the Bible. Let not your heart be troubled. You have the word and the encouragement from God to help us, to help each of us through this life. You see, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The Bible says in uh, John 17, verse 17, that God's word, the Bible, is truth. 
2 Peter 1 verse 3, we have everything we need for life and godliness. God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Psalm 119 verse 105. And so the Bible, God's Word, it ought to lift each of our spirits and help us to walk the way God wants us to walk in this life. And friend, it is that Word of God that actually is going to make us clean and ready for that eternal home. Notice John 15 verse number 3. Jesus says to His disciples, You are already clean because of the Word which I've spoken to you. The Word of God. We're born again by the Word of God. 1 Peter 1, verse 23 through 23 through 25. And so, to live a, a, a pure and holy and righteous life. Friend, if I live by the Bible, then I can know. that I can have the comfort of that. Listen to 1 John 5, verse number 13. John says, these things we write to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, there's comfort, that you may know you have eternal life. Is there comfort to be found in following the teaching of the Bible? Absolutely. I can have the confidence and know that I'm following Christ's teaching and that I'm right in the sight of God because of that. Now, as Jesus discusses John 15, He's also going to teach His disciples, though, that it's not enough to at one point in time have been right. You've got to be faithful to the end and you've got to be fruitful as a Christian. A Christian cannot obey the gospel and then sit down and think all the work's done. A Christian must be a fruit bearer, must be fruitful in the kingdom of God and be faithful till his very last breath. Look at John 15 verses 4 through 5. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. The Christian, by being faithful to Christ, by remaining true to Him, he needs to be fruitful. That means we need to bear the fruit of the Spirit. As mentioned in Galatians 5, verse 22, we need to be faithful unto death. Follow the teaching of Christ. Do good unto all men. Galatians 6, help those who are in need. Spread the gospel. Be a good example. Live as we ought to live. Every day we're bearing fruit by our lifestyle. Christians who love one another, they produce that fruit, Jesus said in John 15, verse 12. And the greatest gift ever given, the greatest example of real love, Jesus illustrates in John 15, verse 13. No greater love has any man than to lay down his life for his friends. When you think about showing fruit of your love, Jesus is the perfect example of that. How do you know Jesus loves you? How do I know Jesus loves me? Well, here's the example. No greater love has any man than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus will go on to say, you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. But friend, I will assure you, the greatest fruit of anybody's love was shown by Jesus, by his willingness to sacrifice and to lay down his life for his followers. And so when we think about Christ and all that he did, we want to make sure that we're a friend of Jesus. Remember John 15, 14? You're my friends if you do whatever I command or ask of you. If I'm going to be a friend of Jesus, you know, a lot of people say, I want to be a friend of Christ. I want to be a friend of Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. That's all true. But what does it really mean to be a friend of Jesus? You are my friends, Jesus said. You want to really be my friend? If you do whatever I command or ask you. Jesus' mother gave us a great kind of motto for living as it relates to that. In John chapter 2, Jesus is about to perform the miracle at Cana. And his mother says to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Friend, isn't that a great motto for life? Whatever Christ says, I just want to do it. Why? Because he's Lord. Because I love him. Because I am his friend. Because I want to show the fruit of my love for Christ by being faithful to him. Now that may mean that the world hates us. Jesus said it would. John 15, verses 18, 19, If the world hates you, it hated me first. The world might hate us for following Christ at times, but friend, that's no excuse for not being a friend to Jesus. Who do you want to be a friend to? A friend of the world, which brings separation from God, James 4, verse 4, or a friend of Christ, 
who can lead us to heaven in eternity. And so this is really a matter of who we're going to serve, who are we going to love, how fruitful are we going to be. And so in these chapters, John 13 through 15, Jesus teaches us to love one another by our service and our action. Jesus teaches us how to overcome discouragement through the promises that He makes. And He teaches each of us that we need to be fruitful in the kingdom of God, following Him and obeying Him in each and every way. Friend, as we think about following Christ and being a friend to Jesus, we ask you today, are you a friend of Christ? Have you obeyed the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Remember Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. What has Jesus commanded one to do to become a Christian? Well, no doubt, a person must be convicted. He is the Savior. In John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. I must believe in Christ to be saved. But belief alone is not all there is. The Bible teaches one must also repent of sin. Peter preached in Acts 3, verse 19, Repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Having changed my way of thinking and changed my way of acting, I then must make that good confession. Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Jesus said, well, Christ said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And friend, Jesus commanded not to do after you're saved. Jesus commanded to be saved. You must be baptized in water. Acts 2 verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Jesus said, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. God. John 3 verse 5, Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16, And Peter said it with such great clarity. The Bible says in 1 Peter 3 21 that along with other things, baptism is essential to salvation. We must be baptized to be saved. And so we ask you today, if you're not a Christian, if you've not followed Jesus, become a friend of Christ. Have the hope of one day going to heaven by following Jesus and proving your love to Him by being faithful until death. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five, or write to us at P.O. Box seven eight eight, McMinnville, Tennessee three seven one one one.